Now, it's a little known fact that I own a coffee shop called Hatter's Coffee. Keeps you awake. But I've decided to sell it. I've had enough and I want out. So I've spoken to a few people about how I go about valuing my business. I want to know how much I can sell it for and make sure I get a fair price. So in this video, we're gonna look at four different ways of valuing my company and trying to come up with a solution. How much should I sell it for? Now, of course, we're using these valuation methods to help you with your exams. So valuations of businesses come up in so many exams. It's a real staple of financial management and advanced financial management. So knowing these techniques is crucial. So I'm going through these four techniques, really high level, giving you the concepts so you understand the basics and what they're about. We're also crucially gonna discuss what's good and what's not so good about each of these evaluation methods, because that's gonna be really helpful in exam answers when doing your discussion. So let's get stuck in. So here's a sneak preview inside my Hatter's Coffee coffee shop. And as you can see, very nicely decorated, but I'm getting fed up of owning a coffee shop and I want to sell it. Now this is largely driven by this lady here. She sits there, she buys one coffee, sits there for four hours looking at videos on her phone and then goes. And that isn't the sort of business model I want to run. I'm not making any money out of this really. So I'm looking to sell up. So the first method I want to look at is an asset-based valuation method. So I can value Hatter's Coffee using this really easy and simple approach. So all we're gonna do is value the equity of the business by taking the total assets and deducting total liabilities. So I had a quick look and my assets come to $450,000 for my coffee shop. So we've got the coffee machines, all the furniture, we've got some cash inventory, all the coffee beans and all the bits I need to make the coffee. But then unfortunately I do have some liabilities, got a loan that I took out to pay for the coffee machines, the lease liability on the premises. I don't own the building, but we do have a lease. Got wages payable to staff and other payables need to pay the coffee supplies and so on. So nice and easy this one. All I'm gonna do is take my assets, deduct my liabilities, and a really quick estimate for the value of Hattie's coffee comes out as 280,000 based on assets. So this is a really quick and easy approach, as you just saw, very easy, readily available information. And it's great if you do have lots of assets and it even works if you're a loss-making company as well. So this is good for something called asset stripping if you're buying a company mainly to acquire its assets. There are some really big downsides here though. The first one, ignoring intangible assets not on the statement of financial position. Things like the reputation of the company, its brand, the skills of staff. I've got some incredible baristas who make lovely coffee. That's not getting included in there. And even all those five-star reviews I get on Google, they are not getting included in my valuation. So lots of intangibles not being included. Those statement of financial position figures may be out of date. If things haven't been revalued properly or recently, they could be really out of date. And also it ignores future growth. It's just looking at a snapshot of the current moment in time. So then I spoke to my friend who said, no, you can't be using asset-based valuations. You need to use PE ratios. So I said, what are they? And my friend said, this is where you take your business's earnings, in other words, your profits after tax, times them by a suitable PE ratio. I said, okay, right, great. This sounds nice and easy. What's this PE ratio about? And my friend said, well, it's just how many times more valuable that company is than the earnings it's making each year. So it can either be the share price over earnings per share, or you could take their total equity and divide it by their total earnings. So if that comes out as 15, it means that that company is 15 times more valuable. Its equity is 15 times more valuable than its current earnings. So it gives you a multiple. It gives you an idea as to how value that business is compared to its annual earnings. So I said, okay, great, that's good. My earnings last year were $40,000 after I've paid off everything, including all my tax and everything. I thought, right, what could I use as a suitable PE ratio then? So I thought, okay, let's think about coffee shops, Starbucks. They sell coffee, let's use theirs. And Starbucks PE ratio is around about 30. So their share price is about 30 times higher than their earnings per share. So if we apply that to my business, we are gonna end up with an equity value of 1.2 million. So I've done the earnings times by the P ratio and we end up with 1.2 million. Now that's significantly higher than the asset-based valuation of just a few moments ago, isn't it? So that's looking pretty good now. 
Now, this approach is good because it is based on similar listed companies. So we're taking information from the same industry. And it does include the impact of brand and skill because I'm using my earnings. And my earnings are taking into account the wonderful baristas I have working there. Also, it's widely used and accepted. Loads of people use this as a valuation method. However, it does rely on this proxy PE ratio. And what we mean by that is you've borrowed it from a similar company. Now, that bottom disadvantage needs adjusting if it's based on a listed company. What I've done there is I've used the PE ratio of Starbucks, who are a multinational global powerhouse of a brand. And I've used it for my individual one-off coffee shop in the UK. Is that suitable? Probably not. I might be slightly ambitious by suggesting that I'm the same size as Starbucks. So that isn't going to be suitable. We may need to adjust that down. And that's why that valuation came out as so high compared to the asset one in particular. The other thing is it uses historic earnings. I base that on my most recent earnings figure. That may not be normal. That may not be sustainable in future years. So that could be really misleading as well. Got to be skeptical there. So I wasn't sure about that one. I said, well, that seems a bit high, 1.2 million for my little coffee shop. So I said, any other ideas? And then I had another friend. He's not really into all this business valuation, but that friend said, how about you try dividend valuations? So you could value your business based on its dividends. Okay, we'll give it a go. So the principle here is you can use the dividend valuation model, the DVM formula to value your business. And I thought, okay, this looks fun. And here's what everything means. So D0 is the most recent dividend. KE is a cost of equity that you can either borrow or you could use CAPM to find that. And then G is your expected dividend growth. Now you put those in and you're going to get this figure P0, which is your total equity value. Now that will be the total equity value if your D0 figure is your total dividend. Just be aware, you can also do this with D0 as one dividend for the business, an individual dividend, and then P0 would be an individual share price. It works in the same way. So you're either going to do it on a small scale or a big scale. So I went and gathered all the information I need about Hatter's Coffee. And my most recent dividend was $10,000. Historic dividend growth over the last few years averaged about 5%. And then again, I used my friends at Starbucks for their cost of equity. So using CAPM, that came out as about 7.5%. So I then went through the process of putting that into the formula. So 10,000 dividend times by 1 plus growth over KE minus growth. And that comes out as $420,000. So somewhere in between the other two valuations that we've seen so far. So feels relatively reasonable, doesn't it? So the good things about this is a method links to shareholder wealth because we are thinking about dividends, which is good for shareholders. It does include the impact of growth. We talked about dividend growth and that rate. And this is quite useful for minority shareholdings. If you're just buying a few shares. Now, if you were using this approach to acquire a whole company, it's not actually that useful because if you acquire a company, you will then dictate their dividend policy. So the whole thing falls apart because the dividends could be anything. So it's good if you're buying a few shares and want to know the value of those, but not if you're valuing a whole company. Some of the other downsides, it does assume constant growth. That 5% we're assuming carries on forever. That formula I just showed you is actually just the growing perpetuity formula. It assumes that the value of the company is the present value of all the dividends forever and ever. So it does assume that growth will stay at that rate forever. The second point there, not all companies pay dividends or they stop dividends, in which case their value theoretically would be zero according to this. And again, we may have to borrow a cost of equity or use CAPM to work it out, which comes with loads of assumptions in its own right. So this is such an approximate method with so many assumptions. It is relatively weak, but gives you a rough idea for, as to a business's value using dividends. So I've left the best until last. I spoke to my friend who actually works in private equity. He's got a really cool job valuing businesses for a living. And I said to him, right, look, I've, I've tried these other methods. They're giving me all different answers. Just tell me straight what is the most accurate and best way to value a company. And he said, free cash flows. And if you speak to anyone who works in private equity or any sort of valuation type role, they will say free cash flows are the way to accurately value a company. So I thought, great, let's do this then. Why didn't I just start with this in the first place? 
And the principle is the value of the company's equity will be the present value of all of the company's free cash flows, FCFs, less the market value of debt. Now, this is assuming that I'm discounting those free cash flows at the cost of capital, and therefore I need to take off the value of debt. There is another approach you can use called the free cash flow to equity method, where you use a slightly different thing. You use free cash flows to equity and then discount using the cost of equity, in which case you don't need to take off the market value of debt. So there is a slightly different way just to be aware. But the most common, we're going to use the cost of capital, the WAC to discount the free cash flows and then take off the market value of debt. So I did this, I went away, and all it is is an NPV. It's a net present value calculation, looking at the present value of all of the cash flows I expect to generate from Hatter's Coffee over the foreseeable future. And I did that at an 8% whack. So I put in some numbers, roughly came out with 8% as the cost of capital. And that gave me an NPV of 950 grand. I then have market value of debt of 250. So that is market value, not just what was on the statement of financial position. So the value of my equity, according to this, is the 950 less 250, which is 700K is the value of Hatter's Coffee according to the free cash flows. Now, the great thing about this approach is it's the most accurate. You are going to get detailed cash flow forecasts for the next few years. And we are saying that that is what the company is worth. It is the present value of its future cash flows. So it's very detailed and accurate. Also includes forecast growth. And it's based on cash, not profit. We much prefer cash. Profit includes all those accounting policies and different standards and how you apply them, which can be quite subjective. Whereas cash is much more factual and much more reliable, which we really like. And you can spend cash. However, this can be time consuming. I spoke to some of my students once who do this as part of their job. And they said this can take up to a year, nine months, a year probably to value a company if they're doing it really accurately. It's often based on the seller's forecasts. So the company that you're trying to buy, you may have to use their information and they're probably going to be quite generous and optimistic with their numbers. So you have to be very skeptical and you really have to challenge those assumptions, which is often why it takes so long because you have to go back and forth and challenge those. And also it relies on that cost of capital being constant. So I used 8% there, but that's going to change. And also it may not be suitable for valuing a particular business. So that's another issue. Also with these, you often have a perpetuity in the last year. I didn't show the workings behind my number, but there would be a perpetuity often in the last year and beyond because you don't really know what's going to happen. So you just assume that cash flows will stay the same after a certain date. And that's another big assumption when you're doing those cash flow valuations. But in theory, the most accurate way, the most detailed and the best way to value a business. And there we go. So we've got the full range. We looked at four valuation methods and they range from $280,000 all the way up to 1.2 million, which I would be more than happy with. So you can see these are all just estimates, aren't they? They always say that this is an art, not a science valuing a company. And we're coming up with suggestions. And then of course, it's all about negotiations and marketing the business properly if you're looking to sell it. Now, I hate to ruin the illusion and shatter your dreams. I'm sure some of you have been Googling Hatter's Coffee in the UK. I don't really own a coffee shop. And do you know what? I don't even like coffee. I don't drink coffee. So all of this was just an example. It makes it more fun, doesn't it? It makes it more interesting if you are thinking about a business rather than just talking about the concepts. So really hope you found this video useful. Make sure to like and subscribe for more videos like this where I'm taking these really complicated concepts and making them simplified and fun to learn. Got loads of other videos on YouTube, so make sure you check those out. Also check out my LinkedIn page, Andrew Mower, for loads of tips about AFM and exams, and then my other social media channels. I even have my own AFM course, so if you want to study with me directly, then get in touch. You can drop me a WhatsApp and I'll be happy to help you. So best of luck with your studies. Go and grab yourself a coffee.